Hey everybody, my name is Jim Farmer. I'm the festival director of Out on Film, Atlanta's LGBTQ Film Festival. Thanks for joining us tonight. I am so very happy to welcome the executive producer of Visible Out on Television, Wilson Cruz. Thank you, Jim, and thank you everyone out there. Thanks for watching. Thanks so much for being here. You know, I have so many questions about Visible, but first I wanted to talk a little bit about June and what's going on in the world right now. June is normally a month of celebration, um, pride parades, you know, exuberance. Yesterday was such a, a great day for us with the Supreme Court ruling, but you know, th there's so much going on in the world right now. We have a pandemic going on. We have sheltering in arms. We have, um, you know, social uprising and protests. How, how do you reconcile the two um, all, with all that's going on in the world right now? It's a big question, Jim. Um, <laughs> I think how I reconcile it all and how I deal with it is that it's an opportunity, right? Um, it's an opportunity for us as a community during Pride Month to live up to the idea that we are a community and that we um, take this opportunity as a community to really start doing some real work on our own issues about on racism um, and to really create an anti-racist LGBTQ movement. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of the pandemic, I think that what was most important for me as someone who is truly concerned about our LGBTQ youth especially, um, we needed to take care of people who were living sheltered at home in homes and municipalities that uh, were unwelcoming, are unwelcoming, um, and really take care of the mental health of people who uh, had a real hard time during a, a shutdown when they were feeling unsafe. So, uh, you know, I know that it's a difficult time for all of us. It's difficult for me. I know I wasn't having much fun. <laughs> um, and, but I, but I think, you know, like, like anything that's difficult, it presents an opportunity for growth. Um, I think many of us in communities of color in our community have been trying to have a conversation about racism, systemic racism in our country um, and how it manifests itself in our community uh, for a long time. And this definitely gives us an opportunity to truly have that conversation and I've been really Heart, heartened by the way that our community has stepped up in solidarity with Black Lives Matter. Um, in the marches that I've participated in, I have been incredibly proud of the representation of the LGBTQ people in those marches and their loud voices. Um, and now I'm excited to see uh, how we transform that into action and real change within our community. Great. Thank you so much. Um, let, let's talk a little bit about this. It, it's such an amazing docu-series. My husband, Craig, and I, I think it premiered February 14th. By February 15th, we were done. It is, it is <laughs> episodes that are all so extraordinary. Um, Visible Out on Television is a five-part documentary that is now streaming globally on Apple TV+. The docu-series explores the history of the American LGBTQ movement through the lens of TV. Combining archival footage with new interviews, the series looks at homophobia, the evolution of LGBTQ characters, and coming out in the TV world. The episode that we just streamed is episode three. Um, I, I didn't realize this until recently, but th this, this series has been a long time in the making. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, so um, David Bender, who was one of the creators of the uh, series along with David Permit, um, but David Bender has been working on this for almost 20 years, I think. Uh, yeah. He was good friends with Vito Russo and was inspired by Vito's Celluloid Closet, which uh, was aired and was produced by HBO uh, in the late 80s. Um, I think late 80s, early 90s. And he yeah. very quickly realized that whereas the, the, the film industry uh, and that story of visibility was important to tell, he started to see that the real movement, the real um, uh, inclusion of LGBTQ stories was happening on TV. And he wanted to, to cover that and really speak to the power of it. Um, but I came on 
uh, seven years ago when he mm -hmm. approached me about being interviewed for the documentary. And um, it became pretty clear that through my work at GLAAD and also through my work as an actor, that I knew a lot of the people who he needed to interview. Um, and so um, just because of my passion for the subject and my Rolodex, <laughs> uh, it became pretty clear that I could be helpful on, on a producing level and I was excited to do it. Um, mainly because I knew on a, on, a, on a personal level, the risks involved in telling LGBTQ stories and um, the effort that needed to be, that, that you need in order to, to make those stories available. Um, but also, you know, not, I, not only did I want it to be a love letter and, a, and a, 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 a way of saying thank you, but I also wanted it to be a real um, call to arms, a challenge to our community, to this industry, to continue to tell the story, to continue to expand uh, the images of LGBTQ people on television, um, especially LGBTQ people of color um, and people uh, and, and trans people. You know, one of the things that, that impressed me so much was just how comprehensive this was. Was it always envisioned as being this comprehensive? Spanning yes. so many days? <laughs> yes, we, we, we always, um, we always knew it was going to be epic, just mainly because we knew how much yeah. material there was. Um, exactly. The, the the difficulty was going to be paring it down, right? Yes. Um, <laughs> as to what's what stories we would be able to include and what we couldn't, and um, and and that was an ongoing conversation throughout uh, the production. So um, thank God that we had a crew and a producing team uh, that was diverse in itself, which allowed us to have very vulnerable and open and um, honest conversations about representation and, and about what moved us in our TV view. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I love the fact that you didn't just go for all the obvious selections. You, you talked about, of course, the Will and Grace, you know, the, the Ellen, but you also talked about smaller shows that had an impact. So can you talk a little bit about focusing on ones that just weren't so obvious? Well, you know, we didn't want to just um, do a clip show of, you know, yeah. the, of, of the biggest hits. Um, I have to give credit to our, our uh, research and editing staff uh, that mm -hmm. really did the work to compile all of the um, titles and um, actors and actresses and characters uh, throughout the years. And I really allowed us to really take a look at the breadth of it. Um, but, you know, we wanted it to be educational. We wanted to um, highlight shows and characters that people may not have um, really focused on as much. I, one, one good example of that, for instance, is, you know, those of us in Atlanta and uh, in the African American and Latino community, we're very familiar with Noah's Ark, um, but yeah. on a on the on a larger scale, in terms of the LGBT community, uh, there were a lot of people who did not know about Noah's Ark, and I really was um, adamant about its inclusion because I knew just how much it meant to um, communities of color. Um, but you know, there are various examples. Uh, you know, for instance, uh, I thought it was, for, for me, I didn't know that the first time the word gay was actually mentioned on television was during the Army McCarthy hearings. Um, you know, uh, I didn't know about um, the, the film A Question of Love, for instance, which I thought was incredibly important to highlight. So, you know, it was, an, it was as much an educational experience for me as I hope it is for our audience. Great. You know, I, I think most of us know you know, about El DeGeneres, her coming in on television. What I, what I didn't realize is that this was coming out and, and the aftermath was just, was this devastating to her and devastating for her career. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, I think Ellen is a great example of mm -hmm. what I talk about when I say people risked everything in order to tell our stories. Um, she, for her own mental health, 
and her own reasons on a personal level decided that she needed to do this for herself. Um, mm -hmm. And she believed that she could push the envelope. Um, but everyone around her, including herself, um, were aware of the risks involved and did it anyway. Um, what impresses me most about Ellen and her story is that she never gave up. That even mm -hmm. after the backlash, when the show um, took a, a dip in the ratings and that terrible um, message from ABC was put before every episode, um, mm -hmm. and then the show was canceled, that you know she took some time you know, to lick her wounds, but then she picked herself up and she really fought to recreate her career. You know, she went on the road and did stand up all over the country and, um, and then begged really to get a talk show um, on the heels of Sharon Osbourne's talk show. You know, the only way that they were allowed, she was allowed to, um, to get her show on the air was if um, the, the, the local networks uh, would take her show along with Sharon Osbourne's, or I should say would take Sharon Osbourne's show, would take Ellen's along with it. Um, yeah. But to me, that, that's indicative of our movement, right? It's like, we've always um, taken two steps forward and then we find ourselves ha you know, being forced to take one step back, but we come roaring back every time. Um, exactly. stronger. So for me, Ellen is the epitome of a fighter. Right. What would you say the role, how would you say that the role of journalist has changed over the decades? Because we have so many journalists now who are open. And how would you say that their role has changed over the years? It's interesting because for, you know, for as long as I can remember, um, we never really knew much about anchors, especially their, of, of their personal lives. You know, yeah. I, I couldn't tell you what Walter Cronkite did <laughs> or thought or cared about because yeah. that was the nature of being an anchor at the time. But I think given um, the reality, the, the way that we find our, the media, the media landscape that we find ourselves in now where so much of our news we find online um, that's tweeted out or posted by, by people in their personal accounts, we get a good feeling for people's beliefs. And, and um, I think that has led to more of a, um, a willingness on, the, on an anchor's part to uh, express their own personal views. Um, mm -hmm. And I think because of that, uh, you know, people felt free to, share their sexual orientation because um, like me, and I talk about this, I talked about this um, in episode three where I really believed that people knowing that I was gay and playing this young gay role on TV was important because I needed people to understand that I personally was putting my own stamp of approval on it. And in that way, um, when Rachel Maddow or Anderson Cooper report on something like Pulse, it becomes personal and it allows an audience to understand the story on a, on a real and personal level. Um, and that packs a punch. Sure. We have lots of questions to leave one of these. What is one thing that you learned or surprised you while doing this project? <laughs> I mean, I can make a list, but you know, honestly, when we, when I, when I heard that, you know, we were approaching Tim Dunn, I was like, well, that's going to be fantastic. He's going to have, you know, great things to say that are funny and it'll lighten yeah. up the mood. And then he shocked us all by giving one of the most powerful testimonials in the documentary in which he talks about, um, the abuse, both mental and physical abuse that he experienced from his father. Um, and to the point where he experienced um, conversion therapy, um, you know, the trauma of that and the effects of it on his life and his, his own mental health. So I was surprised by that. Um, 
like I said earlier, I, I, I learned more about the Army McCarthy hearings. Yeah. Um, I didn't know about Mark Siegel and his zaps, you know, where he, yeah. you know, popped up on, speaking of Walter Cronkite, on Walter Cronkite's um, Sunday, on, on Walter Cronkite's evening news. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, it reminds me a lot about uh, today, for instance, because what Mark Siegel was doing was civil disobedience. And so many people at the time thought, oh, you know, this isn't helpful. You know, how is this going to help the cause for LGBTQ people? But as we can see, you know, as an example of today, um, civil disobedience is important because it begins a conversation. It's not yeah. the end of the conversation, but it disrupts your life enough to say, why is this happening? Sure. What is, why is this person angry? What are they upset about? And it forces me to have a conversation about it. Um, and I'm really grateful to Mark Siegel for the, all of the risks that he took, especially since he could have faced some real yeah. jail time if Walter Cronkite hadn't been the gentleman with an open mind that he was. Exactly. Wilson, how important is it these days to have people of color and, and queer voices, you know, behind the camera in shows such as Pose and Vita? Oh, it's, it's everything. It is, you know, when people ask me, um, what, what, what else can we do? How, you know, what is the next, um, how can we gain more progress in terms of visibility for LGBTQ people? The answer to that is more content creators who are people of color. Um, because then we have people behind the camera who are telling stories that are from their own lived experience. Um, it becomes personal. And, um, you know, it's only when we start to have more inclusive voices that we will actually see uh, a, a television you know, media landscape that actually looks like the country and the world that we live in. You know, it was only about five or six years ago that when GLAD was, GLAD does their um, where we are on television and their yeah. network ratings every year that we were still talking about gay white men when we were talking about where we were on television. So yeah. the majority of, of the roles and the storylines that we saw uh, up until about, well, less than a decade ago, were really about gay white men and sometimes lesbians. <laughs> So um, if we're gonna see that change, if we're going to actually hear voices and see the lived experience of LGBT people of color, it has to come from LGBTQ people of color. Exactly. Wilson, when you were growing up, what, what, did, you watch, what did you watch on television? What, what, did you see anything that, you, that, you read, that resonated with you? <sighs> yes. <laughs> But you know, if I'm gonna be honest with you, and I know it sounds obnoxious, I've said it uh, many times, but you know, the first time I saw myself on TV was the first time I saw myself on TV. Yeah. Um, you know, I can, I can think of maybe one person who was kind of, not kind of, he was my North Star in terms of pop culture. And that was Harvey Firestein. Um, and Harvey Firestein and I, um, aren't exactly from the same place <laughs> and having the same experience. Yeah. But what he was to me and what he still is to me, first of all, beyond being a friend, is mm -hmm. um, an example of someone who A, wouldn't take no for an answer, mm -hmm. and B, used his art as activism. And they were equal measure art and equal measure activism. Um, sure. He used his own experience in order to illuminate the experience of all of, our, of all of us. And so when I look at something like Torch Song Trilogy in which yeah. uh, he delivers a monologue to his mother, say, explaining to her all of the ways in which he um, needed to become self-reliant in order to survive because he was prepared to be disowned by her. Um, I understood that on a personal level because I was doing the same thing. Um, so for me, it was hard. Yeah. This is the portion of the evening where I became a complete geek. Um, 
Yay. <laughs> does, does, I mean, it, it feels hard to believe that, that my so-called life was 26 years ago. Does it, does it feel that way for you? Yes and no. <laughs> I mean, yeah. let's be honest, uh, between now and beginning of March feels like 26 years. Um, exactly. But, uh, <laughs> but um, you know, it's still fresh in my mind, but I also yeah. have so, enough distance from it now to sure. really appreciate it and the power of it. Yeah. On a personal note, that was one of the first shows I watched that I really related to. Um, so thank you for that. Um, that means everything to me. Sure. I, you, I mean, it seemed like you had a real connection to Ricky, just even from a script level, just from reading the script. Yes. I mean, I, I can't um, stress enough how unbelievable that script was when I received it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I never dreamt that I was gonna be able to play a role like that. I didn't think it would ever be on television, let alone that I would be the person who would get to play it. Yeah. Um, so it meant a lot to me and you know, it still chokes me up because I remember reading the script for the first time and just, I, I remember having to read it three times because I didn't think it was real. <laughs> to be honest. Yeah. So, um, you know, as we continue to make the series, uh, Wilson and Ricky really started to um, blur in, you know, in the lines. Because yeah. um, because Winnie and I became very close, and she became close with all of the actors on the show. Yeah. And there was kind of an osmosis, I think, of information that she was taking in. And, um, and she used a lot of my own experience in order to tell his story. Sure. Um, what what kind of, I mean, obviously you, you said this, but you, you got so much feedback during the time. What, what kind of feedback do you get from people about this show? That's an easy way to make me cry. Um, every day, yeah. every day. I, every, every single day, whether on social media or out in public, um, someone will say to me, you changed my life, or that character changed my life, or I felt seen for the first time, or I didn't kill myself, or my parents and I had a conversation because we watched that show together. Um, but then there are stories of people like Janet Mock, or Lena Waithe, who yeah. have expressed to me that they were inspired by that character. But what inspires me is that they took that inspiration and ran with it yeah. and, and passed on their own inspiration. But then, sure. you know, sure. on top of that, and it's fresh on my mind because I received a photo of this just last week, but, you know, I've had two presidents of the United States say to me, how important Ricky Vasquez was to them. First, Bill Clinton, but in person, Barack Obama let me know that he watched my so-called life. And, you know, for me, that is the highest of compliments. And, um, you know, the fact that that little boy, that 19 year old boy got to, um, got to be that for all those people um, and hopefully change the landscape for them is something that I will be proud of until I go to my grave. Thank you for that. There, there, was, there was no one on television like Ricky. <laughs> I mean, yeah. and that was, you know, and that was 1995. And that was, I mean, I, I, you know, did, did, did ABC, was there any flight from ABC about how, about Ricky? Um, no. Okay. Um, you know, and I've, I've had conversations with Winnie about this through the years, but um, I think because uh, Marshall Herskovitz and Ed Zwick had had this long history of successful um, show, you know, a, a, a long history with them because of Thirty Something, um, that they let them do what they wanted to do. Um, I never received a, a a bad note, and maybe I was being sheltered from it, but I don't think I was. Mm -hmm. I think they were very supportive. Um, and even in the, the fan mail 
at the time uh, that came in was really supportive. I got some, you know, white supremacist BS thrown at me by uh, once or twice, but the letters that I remember, the one that I remember the most that's in the storage unit in Torrance somewhere is um, mm -hmm. it's a letter by a young man from uh, the Midwest who wrote to me um, about how important that show is to him um, and how badly he wanted to come out to his own parents. And on the page, you can see where the teardrops fell onto the page and smeared the ink. Wow. So to me, you know, ABC could have come and said whatever they wanted to say because I knew we were doing the work. Yeah. I, I watched the final episode earlier today. There's this amazing moment where you and Delia are talking and you say for the first time ever, I'm gay. And that's the first time I've said that. Wilson, how long, when did you feel comfortable saying those words in real life? Well, I was uh, 16 when I came out to, to friends. Um, there, were about, there were a group of us in high school who were a bit of a support group that we created for ourselves, uh, mm -hmm. all young men of color. Um, and I came out to my parents at 19 because of my so-called life. So I knew that I would be coming out publicly and that the show was about to premiere. Um, and I definitely wanted them to hear it from me before they heard it, you know, on the Donahue show, which I was actually on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. From one iconic show to another iconic show, can you talk a little bit about Noah's, how, how did Noah's art come up for you? So Patrick Ian Polk, the creator and executive yeah. producer of Noah's Ark, is a dear friend. I've actually known him uh, since my so-called life days. Mm -hmm. And um, we'd been wanting to work together for years. And, you know, he wanted purposefully to create a show um, that was kind of inspired by Sex in the, in sex in the City, uh, mm -hmm. but for African-American and Latino men, mm -hmm. uh, gay men. And, um, but he also knew that, as, that what, one of the things he really wanted to do was have a conversation about HIV and AIDS in our community. Yeah. Um, and he approached me, I remember him approaching me and saying, how do you feel about playing uh, a HIV, uh, a, a doctor working in HIV who has HIV and is basically Prince Charming? And I said, when do we start? Uh, <laughs> so, um, you know, for me, it was really, um, it, was a, it was a freeing experience because yeah. I never had, I was never the object of, you know, uh, desire in any, of, in any of the roles I ever played until that role. And um, it was my first sex scene, um, my first, you know, gay kiss. Uh, so, you know, it was, it was, um, it was a great experience for me. You know, I, it's to have a cast and a crew that was predominantly uh, LGBTQ or people of, and people of color, um, and we were telling our own stories uh, was really exciting. The show had such an impact, though. It, it, it reached. It, it wasn't just an LGBTQ audience. It had a very mainstream appeal. Can you talk a little bit about the impact and how everybody seemed to watch it when it was on? That I'm sorry, say that again. It had such a mainstream appeal. The show, yes, yeah. I mean, listen. Uh, I think within the the African American LGBTQ uh, community, it was huge. Um, mm -hmm. But what we didn't know was that it was also big in the non LGBTQ yeah, uh, exactly. African American community. We would. I mean, my experience was always. I, I, you know, I started to think that they were showing Noah's Ark like during the training services for TSA because every time I went through TSA, one of them was like, Junito! And I would, you know, <laughs> and it was always weird for me because Junito is actually my name at home. It's what my family calls me because I'm Wilson Jr. So yeah. nobody ever calls me Junito except for my family. And then I did that show and suddenly in the airport, I'm always called Junito, so I'm always thinking that my family is stalking me, especially yeah. in Atlanta. Um, but, you know, I, I do think that it was a catalyst for 
conversations around LGBTQ people mm -hmm. in um, communities of color. Um, I don't, I don't think many people saw that until Noah's Ark uh, came around. Reboots are off the rage right now. Will there be a Noah's Ark reboot? Has there been any detail? Oh, oh, detail. <laughs> That's all I got. Okay. All right. <laughs> Speak, I mean, you've done, you've done theater, you've done film, you've done television series. I mean, you actually filmed the series in Atlanta, Red Band Society. What, what was that experience like filming here? Oh my God, I loved that experience. I loved that show. Um, yeah. Piece of trivia. Um, I worked at GLAD. I took two years off of my career for two, uh, for two years to work at GLAD to be yeah. their director of entertainment partnerships. But when I finished, um, because, I was there until they found a new president. When she came yeah. on, I left and I called up my agents and said, hey, you know, I'm available if you want to send me out on an audition. And the very first audition they sent me on was two lines in the pilot of Red Band Society. And I was like, well, you know, let me get, let me get the juices flowing again and get used to going into these auditions. And I went in and I did the scene and they hired me on the spot, but then um, I went and did the pilot and Octavia Spencer and I hit it off so well. And you know, she's been playing sassy uh, nurses all of her career. And the last thing she wanted to do was play another sassy nurse. And so they needed a sassy nurse. And I said, here I am. <laughs> so, um, you know, Octavia was incredibly supportive. We loved working together in that pilot and she really supported the idea of bringing me on um, as a recurring character. And I ended up, you know, I was only supposed to be in the pilot. I was, then I was only supposed to do four, I think. And then I ended up doing every episode. Nice. So I had a great time. I, I lived at the, um, the W in Midtown. Um, <laughs> It's our host hotel, you know. <laughs> yes, I I lived there for okay. almost for, for nine for almost nine months. Nice. Yeah. Nice. I have a lot of questions. I want I want to get some of these. What would you say to a younger 1995 version of yourself? I would say that all of the things that um that I was so concerned made me different, whether it be my sexual orientation or my race, my Afro-Latino-ness, uh, my, my gender expression, um, all of those things that I thought uh, were wrong with me ended up being my secret powers, my superpowers. Um, because all of that informed me at a time and made me, made me ready for a time when we needed to hear about those communities. Um, and I would tell him to worry less about what people think um, and worry more about um, being good at what I do and being prepared, uh, fully prepared for the challenges that would be presented me. Um, I, think we, I think we spend way too much time uh, worried about uh, negative uh, ideas about change instead of working for the change and trusting that the world is ready for them. Okay. I, I have to ask you about Star Trek. Did you ever in a million years think you would be part of Star Trek, much less as, as part of a gay couple? Uh, no. Uh, <laughs> I mean, uh, I was a huge Star Trek fan. I think, you know, because Star Trek has always represented this North Star, this ideal of what we could be. It, it always, challenged us to live up to our potential in terms of racial justice and uh, gender and um, 
now sexual orientation. Um, but I never, ever believed that I would get the opportunity to do it. I mean, listen, growing up, I wanted to do two things. I wanted to be on Broadway and I wanted to be in Star Trek, but I thought those were, you know, <laughs> those, those were like dreams so far that, you know, just having them, just seeing them was enough, yeah. but um, achieving them didn't seem real until they actually happened. Yeah, you know, Star Trek fans are very devoted, but they're also very opinionated about what they want. Huh, tell me a little bit about that. <laughs> Duh, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, I don't want to give any spoilers away, but I, I think most people know this. But your character, your character passed away and then came back. When you first learned that your character had passed away, how did you react? I was devastated. Yeah. Uh, I I found out two weeks before we shot the the episode uh, yeah. in which I would the character would be killed off. Um, I was actually working on 13 Reasons Why. It was my first day back on season two of 13 Reasons Why when I got the phone call, because I was yeah. filming them at the same time. Yeah. Um, so I had just gotten out of makeup and I got the phone call and I was sent back to makeup because I cried off all of my makeup. So um, I was devastated for about a week. Um, and then they let me know pretty quickly that they were going to, that they wanted to find a way to bring me back. Um, and they had an idea of what that was. And, you know, I wanted to make sure that however we, however this character came back, that, um, that A, it was epic and B, that there was a cost to the loss of his life. You know, so many times we see these, um, gay characters, especially gay characters of color being killed off on television shows and there's never a, a, a real cost to what happened to them. It's as if it never happened. Um, I wanted to make sure that not only that there was a cost to what had happened to him, but that, that he's a different person because of it. That right. there was growth uh, that they all learned and that he learned something about himself because of it. Um, and there's this, there's this um, idea called post-traumatic growth uh, that a, a traumatic experience can lead someone to appreciate their life more and or make changes that they wouldn't have made uh, had, had a traumatic experience not happened to them. So we'll see how he's been affected by that in season three. And I can tell you that one of the ways is that he, as a doctor, is far more, um, is, is looking at, at his patients in a more holistic way, not just their physical health, but also their mental health. Sure. Have you heard anything about when Toronto is gonna be ready to start filming again? Um, I'm hearing that they'll, they'll be probably, you know, in a similar vein as what's happening here in, in LA. I mean, they didn't have quite the same kind of outbreak that the States have had. So rumor is that they'll be up and running probably before we are in the States, but you know, we'll see. I know nothing. Exactly. One other question. Um, how do you see, how do you, how do you see parallels of what the world is protesting for today with the LGBTQ movement? I'm, I lost the, part, the first part of that, what'd you say? How do you see parallels of what the world is protesting for today with the LGBTQ movement? How do I parallel the movements today and the LGBTQ movement, is that what yes. you said? Yes. Yes. Well, I mean, there's the obvious, which is both of these, you know, our movement and, the, and these protests that we are uh, experiencing today uh, mm. are in response to um, an abuse of force by the police. Um, you know, trans and African, uh, African American and Latina trans and drag artists at Stonewall were the ones who we have to thank for our movement today. You know, we understand uh, the, the, the consequences of police brutality because 
our movement was born from it. Um, so it's, you know, we cannot, we, we can't separate the two movements in any way. Um, on top of that, we are, as people of color, a part of this community, uh, of, of the LGBTQ community. So the Black Lives Matter movement is our movement. We are a part of it. Um, and it's our job as a community to show up in solidarity with this movement. Um, and I see that happening. I'm really proud of the way that, that we're responding and showing up. Um, yeah. Okay. <laughs> wrap this up in a minute, but one thing I wanted to, to give to you, um, you have been a role model trailblazer for so long, you've been activists for so long. So we wanted to present you with an award. So we have an award for you, uh, the 2020 Trailblazer Award from Out on Film. And we will get this to you. So thanks for everything that you do, you have done. And thanks for being such a great activist and role model for so many people, Wilson. Many well, thank you. It means the world to me. And I'm really grateful to you and Out on Film there in Atlanta for making our stories available. Um, you know, there's so much power in the ability to tell our own stories and watch them communally at a festival like that. And so I know how difficult this time is that you can't gather together and celebrate and, um, and, and view the content as you usually do. But um, I'm really moved by the spirit of community that continues to find ways to come together despite all of this. Um, you know, I have always been a, a, a huge fan of LGBTQ film festivals because they've always been incredibly supportive to me. Um, and and um, to receive an award from you guys means the world to me. So I really appreciate it, especially because I love Atlanta so much and I have um, such fond memories of being there and working. I agree, thank you so much. Visible on television is now streaming on Apple TV. Uh, plus, it's an amazing ducky series. Please watch it. This is this is a great time to watch it. Thank you all for joining us. And Wilson, thank you so very much. Thank you, Jim. Thank you, everyone. Thanks.